Hey everybody, welcome to Reflections, the wisdom of Edgar Casey. We're coming to you as always, courtesy of our broadcasting partner, moretalk.tv. And joining me again today on the show is Lynn Sparrow Christie. Lynn is a director for the Journey to Wholeness, an integrative growth program, and has been working in the field of spiritual growth and personal healing for her entire adult life. Lynn's work has been shaped by a deep connection to spirituality during childhood that led her through traditional Christian faith to the batter, barrier shattering, excuse me, work of Edgar Casey and on to the leading edge thinking that characterized the contemporary integral evolutionary movement. Along the way, Lynn has developed an eclectic career as a writer, a conference speaker, hypnotherapist, life coach, minister, and trainer. She is also trained as a master hypnotherapist a hypnosis trainer, life coach, and a master NLP practitioner. She has also done extensive personal study, training, and practice with energetic modalities such as Qigong and energy medicine and often shares these practices with her clients in her integrative approach. Lynn's latest book, entitled Beyond Soul Growth, Awakening to the Call of Cosmic Evolution, is available now at the ARE catalog and I highly recommend that. She is a prolific writer. Today on the show, Lynn will be telling us all about the Journey to Wholeness and Integrative Growth Program. And this is the initial program offered by the Tarsia Center at the Association for Research and Enlightenment here in Virginia Beach. The Tarsia Center offers programs in emotional processing, healing, integration, and wholeness. If you'd like to learn more or sign up for a free informational teleconference, you can visit journeytowing.org. Lynn, thank you so much for joining us today on the show. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Excellent. And I know you've been involved in quite a bit lately, but I want to talk about something that you've been involved with that uh, I'm really excited about. Um, you're involved with a new program for spiritual growth and healing called the Journey to Wholeness and Integrative Growth. And we're going to spend the show kind of talking about that and what that all entails. But can you tell us a little bit about how this came about? Well, it was actually one of those wonderful times when synchronistically many factors come together. I had known my co-director developer Eileen Malo through ARE work for probably more than 25 years and we became closer friends when we found ourselves in the same small group and discovered we had a shared interest in ongoing adult development, evolutionary growth, and integral theory and we began meeting just because we wanted to share what we were experiencing using those approaches in our own spiritual path and wanting to go deeper into that avenue of spiritual growth and development. Meantime, longtime ARE member Cassie Tarcia out in California had over the course of her lifetime undergone some really incredible deep transformative growth and healing work and she had approached ARE about developing a program where people could do a deeper kind of work. We have wonderful conferences and retreats already but they're limited in time. We have a wonderful search for God study group program but those groups are encouraged not to get too deeply into people's personal stuff so to speak. And Cassie right. had a vision for a spiritual growth and healing program and wanted to make a donation to help make that possible. And it turns out that Eileen had been dreaming of a program like that for a long time. So she said to me, Lynn, are you interested in working with me on this? And we began talking about how we might take many different threads and put them together into a program of spiritual growth and development that really is unusual, if not truly unique. It runs over the course of an entire calendar year. It's very customized. That is, each individual's issues are the stuff that they work on through the course of those 12 months. There is monthly telephone coaching, spiritual mentoring, there are monthly in-depth teleconferences. We know that people can't just constantly be traveling to any particular location, but we also know that connection with a group is key. We can only get so far on our own. So we began looking at some of the technology of today that lets us 
do much more in-depth personal connection, breaking people into small groups, video conferencing, and so on. And we developed a program that is based on 12 modules that have a monthly teleconference experience and in two cases over the course of the year, a live retreat here in Virginia Beach where people can take advantage of the wonderful body, mind, spirit therapies at the ARE Spa and Health Center where they can meet together in a home-like setting for deep processing of their experience, for sharing, for dream work, for group meditation. Because part of this program is about moving toward that unity consciousness where every one of us is leveraged by the consciousness, the love, and the efforts of others. We also have a component that we're calling the Virtual Retreat Center that will be available 24-7, where we will be able to uh, put up videos, articles, questions for pondering, and there will be a bulletin board-like aspect to that where people can maintain their connection with one another in between the formal scheduled events on a month-by-month basis. So the entire program is geared around taking the best of live and internet-based work, taking the best of individualized and group work, and putting it all together in a format that we have not seen anywhere else. Absolutely. Wow. That sounds amazing, Lynn. Yeah, we're pretty excited about it. Absolutely. Such a holistic approach to it, and, and it really is an integrative yeah. approach. And, and saying that, what do you hope those who do the, go through the healing and in, in your journey to wholeness and integrative growth, what do you hope that people get out of it? Well, one way of looking at it is to say that this is a program about recognizing the patterns that are keeping us right. stuck. Right. Just about everyone who's serious about the spiritual path for any length of time will notice a tendency for the same challenges to come up in life. The specifics may change, but the underlying themes will tend to be the same. Sort of thing that there may be a given social dynamic that a person always finds him or herself in the same place within a social group. You may have the person who says, every job I've been at, a coworker steals my ideas. Or the, the classic case of the person who says, I keep dating and getting into a relationship with the same person over and over again. Even though the names and the faces may change, a tendency for us to encounter the same circumstances, the same challenges, but, and this is the part that's really important, the same internal responses and the same behaviors and choices that, that come up in response to that. And that's where these patterns can keep us stuck. Because often, we are not aware of the many layers and levels of the way these patterns are working through us. Some people are unconscious enough of their patterns that they don't even recognize that it is a pattern. But then there comes that point where you say, well, not only is the circumstance the same, I tend to have the same thoughts about it. And then, oh, I tend to have the same emotions about it. And as you cut deeper and deeper, oh, I tend to have the same sensations in my body when this comes up. Right, and right. so the idea is to take those patterns that people are experiencing in their lives and find ways to help them work through those. Because in essence, the underlying philosophy, I guess we could say, is that every time one of these things comes up, our tendency you know, we have that, that definition of insanity to keep doing something the same way and expect the results to be different. Right. And that is the tendency of the small uh, contracted and protected self, the self that often in spiritual circles is called the ego self or the small self. But the very fact that these things keep coming up is an indication that it's really an invitation to expand beyond a smaller contracted identity and move one notch bigger, wider, more expansive into our deeper spiritual identity. So the first step, of course, is to know that these patterns are even occurring. And the next step is to move deeper and deeper into 
awareness and understanding and an ability to really be with the responses that we have in those recurring patterns that come up in our lives. Absolutely. And you talk a lot about these patterns and it, it seems like th this is an issue that everyone's dealing with and I think the biggest issue you talk about it being kind of an unconscious thing. These patterns yes. are unconscious. So for somebody who's struggling with this, how could what would you tell them to help recognize their own patterns, their own personal story that's playing out in their lives? Well, the first thing we do in the journey, and I think this is one of the things that, that sets it apart, before January, before that first official start to the program, the coaching mentoring relationship begins with each of the participants in the program with a couple of assessments. And the first one is looking at the person's underlying blueprint of motivation through a process of values elicitation. Now, you know, that word values is supercharged and it's often used as a big club to beat somebody up with for not sharing your particular values. But the way we mean it here is that our values are what's truly important to us. And most people, and especially those on the spiritual path, will tend to have two sets of values. One set of values that's all about what we should, as good spiritual seekers, find important. And another set of values about what's really driving us. So we may say we have a strong value on turning the other cheek or meditating every day or whatever it may be, but if we're not actually doing those things, there's a deeper, more authentic value that's more important to us than doing what we say is important. So the process of values elicitation is pretty interesting because through a series of conversational uh, sessions, we get a sense of what is truly important to the individual. And in many cases, we find that the underlying blueprint of motivation is kind of tripping over itself. There may be a value in one area that's in conflict with a value in another, and they're canceling each other out. So we can't figure out why we don't get further. Or there could be a value that has become very loomingly large at the unconscious level, such as keeping ourselves safe or avoiding getting into a situation that didn't work out well before. And that value is acting like a lid on all of our attempts to grow. So the first step is to get a sense of some core issues that are part of what the person may have been struggling with without even realizing it. And so we could say that our values are the blueprint of motivation that drives us from an unconscious level, but they are also how we evaluate how satisfied we are with our life experience, because we're always comparing what is happening in our lives with what is truly important to us. And if there's not a good mesh there, we feel dissatisfied, we feel like something's missing. And so that's sort of our starting point for, for moving people into the program. Now my partner Eileen Malo is also going to be doing an assessment in one of today's really interesting fields and that's called spiritual intelligence. We had a real breakthrough a couple of decades ago when emotional intelligence came on the scene. Well, there's also such a thing as spiritual intelligence and I would rather let Eileen, maybe at another time, talk about the details of that, but she will be leading people through an assessment that will uh, give them a sense of their strengths, their assets in terms of spiritual intelligence, and where are the areas that they might want to put a little bit more emphasis as they chart their own personal growth work over the coming 12 months. So that's sort of a starting point. Beyond that, I think we could say, in one sense, there is only one work, and that work is continually breaking past whatever our previous limitations of identity are, always moving the boundaries outward, outward, outward. And knowing that there is always just one work, we also know that human beings need a way in or a hook to give them a, a chance to work on that. 
And so we've divided the journey into 12 modules so that we have 12 different thematic approaches to the same work. Growth of our identity, breaking past limitations, loosening the constrictions of the small self. And so our modules have themes like past lives and vibrational energetics and working with your shadow. But I think the thing that's important to know is that this is not designed to be a conference where you get information. We are looking for those folks who have filled their understanding, their brains, their memories, countless notebooks and drawers full of CDs and cassette tapes before them about content about the information of the spiritual path. And what we wanted to do now is take those experienced spiritual seekers and growers and give them ways to use all that knowledge. So our emphasis will always be on processing through your experience the things you might know about subtle energy, about chakras. Now that's not saying we won't give any guidance about it, but the emphasis is always going to be on process. Absolutely. And so it I sounds wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay, well, I, I didn't know whether I was supposed to come up for air and let you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you're absolutely fine. I, I, okay. I love it when, it, when you know, I just okay. get the guests to go, to go off and talk. So that was, that was perfect. That was perfect. So, for example, we, we start right off with the first module on building internal alignment and that's where we look at uh, what the values are and the idea in values work by the way is never ever to get someone to change their values the idea is always to assist that person in making their values work for them and when our values are working for us it's a very different experience than when they are working against us so that alignment is with our interior self, alignment with the divine, and of course alignment with and among each other as we coalesce an intentional group because that will always be super important. We move on then in the next module to look at one of the main ways that people can become aware of their patterns and the places where they're stuck and that is increased capacity for self-observation. A lot of times, if you if you see people who maybe are not on the spiritual path, it will be amazing how they don't even notice that circumstantial patterns are happening. The next step is to be able to recognize, oh, this has happened before, more than once. This must be a pattern. But then we go deeper to recognize, this is always what I say to myself when this pattern comes up. These are my greatest hits, favorite thoughts that I have when this challenge occurs and begin to step outside of those thoughts to think, well, maybe I could have a different perspective on it. But even that is relatively superficial until we become comfortable with truly experiencing first the emotions that arise in connection with those patterns. Because a lot of times we've been, we've been sort of taught to think that there are only two things you can do with emotions. You can express them in an unbridled way, which seldom leads to anything good. And in fact, it may tend to just make that emotional pattern deeper, stronger. It's like if you take a dirt road and rain has put ruts in it, if you keep sending the rain down those same ruts, they'll just get deeper and deeper. So. On the one hand, we, we have the model of where well, you express the emotion and that makes it go away. doesn't usually work. On the other hand, we have the old tried and true method of, well, then let's repress it. Let's keep it out of awareness. Let's soldier on and not let that unpleasant feeling get in the way of my daily life. There's a certain utility in that, and we all have had to do that to some degree. But you can only hold things like that down for just so long before they snowball and become bigger and bigger. And then the first part of every day, the best of your energy, so to speak, the cream right off the top of your energy is spent keeping a cap on emotions that you're trying not to have to deal with. 
So there's a sweet spot. And the sweet spot is being able to experience, be within the emotion in such a way that it isn't an explosive or devastating thing, and in such a way that you're not dissociated or detached from it either. Some of the deepest spiritual work can come from discovering that you can just allow a feeling to be there, and in that moment, you're still okay. So we'll be taking people through modalities that have to do with that. But then there's a layer yet deeper, and that's sensing the way those feelings have a somatic and energetic component. More and more of a sense of the energy flows in the body, more and more of a sense of how these patterns can get caught in our auric field or caught in the flow through the energy meridians or the nadis in the body. And whether you're talking Chinese or Hindu uh, systems, they would all agree that when we have blockages in our energy flow, it tends to have ramifications physically, emotionally, mentally, behaviorally. So working with observing more and more of what happens energetically in the body is a part of this journey to wholeness and integrative growth as well. And along the way, we, we look at this opportunity through various themes. For example, the chakra system is a fantastic way of looking for our most functional and our most dysfunctional patterns because each of the chakras has, as I'm sure you and most of our listeners know, Brent, a thematic tone to it. And that is a clue to where your life opportunities for growth might lie. So that if you find that a lot of your energy is blocked at the throat and you've got a fifth chakra issue going on, that's more than just seeing how you can break through the energy blockage. It's saying, okay, well, where are issues of finding my voice, my truth, and, and my, my, my true will, as opposed, you know, we often have this idea that will is this pull ourselves up and do what we don't feel like doing, willpowerish kind of thing where the will of, of that fifth chakra is much more finding your authentic self and acting from it. So we begin to analyze, not, not analyze is probably a bad word, we begin to notice and become more aware of the way the chakra themes can be a wonderful clue as to where we are right now given the opportunity to grow. And it works in the positive way as well. If you find that that heart chakra is just wide open and, 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 and alive and pulsating with energy, that becomes a tremendous resource that can assist you in your ongoing work. In fact, the, the, the energies of the heart is another of the thematic entryways through one of the 12 modules. We're going to be including some heart math training. People who enroll in the journey will get a little heart math a biofeedback monitor that they can use to learn to create that coherence, as it's called in the heart math work, between the heart energies and the brain head energies and, and our thoughts and so on. And so that becomes another entryway in. We'll be encouraging people to look at patterns that come from past lives. And among the body, mind, spirit therapies that people might uh, select when they're here at Virginia Beach could be doing past life regression. But we know a lot of people will come into this program already having done a lot of regression. And they may not need more past life knowledge. What they may need is processing of the residue in memory from what already happened. Because knowing about a past life and processing its energies are not necessarily the same thing. Right. So we have other modules. I mean, I, one that I'm really excited about comes a little bit later in the year, but it is recognizing the gifts in what we have denied within ourselves. And this is about working with the shadow. 
many times, and it's all part of that repressing the unpleasant things, many times people are really afraid, if I go too deeply inside, will what I find there be so distasteful to me, so at variance with what I want to be and experience, that it will be too much to handle. What people often don't recognize is that our shadow selves are really a tremendous repository of abilities, positive energies that can be used. So when we get to that section on shadow, it's going to be about finding and bringing to the surface many of the aspects of ourselves that we've denied and are actually gifts being offered to us for our greater unfolding. Absolutely. And I love this topic. It's something that's very personal to me. I think the shadow self and the shadow aspect of the whole spiritual journey is an essential part. And once integrated and understood, it it's, it's really takes you to this whole different level of understanding about how deep you, know, you truly go. But I, I know in talking about that, I know there are probably people who, who might say when we talk about these patterns, well, I'd rather not deal with my patterns because they are so painful for some people. So right. I'm sure you experience that in, in working with this program and working with individuals that you do and the groups that you do. Um, what, what do you tell somebody who's hit a wall like that and they say, I, I don't know, I don't want to work with these patterns. They're too much for me to handle. Well, first of all, the individual is always in the driver's seat. There's nothing in this program that's going to force people to go beyond where they want to go. And that's one of the reasons we love the, the way we were able to customize this. Every person will meet with either Eileen or myself for a telephone coaching mentoring session each month, sometimes with both of us, and that's a little bit more of a, a quiet private area to get a sense of what that individual's limitations and boundaries might be, and we'll always look for ways that are within that person's comfort zone not to say that sometimes people won't be urged to go a little bit outside of their comfort zone, but this is not about going in with a sledgehammer and, and breaking people's boundaries. It's about creating an atmosphere that makes it safe, that makes it even inviting to go a little bit deeper. And so I, I think that people should know that they will be charting their own course. This will be very customized, but we like to think of the journey as a sacred container that will hold people in a safe and secure place while they do that particular unfolding work. Excellent. Yeah. And talking about this work and, and working with patterns that we've been talking about, all this, this journey that people are going to go through as they, they enter into your program, um, what kind of practices could you give our listeners today that can help us get unstuck once we do recognize a pattern and once we see what we're going through? Well, of course, one of the tried and true things that, that we are all aware of is the power of meditation to help us expand in, in our capacity to be a more uh, expansive, non-contracted self. Now, that being said... There are different forms of meditation, and part of what we'll be doing is helping people find the meditation that may be best suited to their particular growth at hand. Many, for example, who have spent years in the KC work do an affirmation-based meditation, which is wonderful. More and more, you're seeing mindfulness meditation entering into uh, many of the ARE circles. That's a different kind of meditation that actually will develop different capacities. There's something even beyond mindfulness meditation where, or, and in mindfulness meditation, in case I'm sure there would be some who don't know exactly what that is, in mindfulness meditation you're training yourself more and more to be the witness to your own internal mentations. There is, there is a meditation where you're not even wit paying attention like a witness. You are simply learning to be aware of awareness itself. And it's not that the contents of the mind go away, but that you're discovering that in any given moment, there are always two components. There is that which you are aware of, 
whether it's an affirmation, whether it's what you're witnessing, whether it's tasting your food as you eat your lunch, there's that which you are aware of, but the foundation, the, the substratum of that is always the awareness that allows any of that to even be. And people can learn to rest in awareness where there is nothing interesting enough to pay attention to it other than simply being awareness. And that tends to break us past virtually all of the defined boundaries of the self. So that, that's just one little example. We will be encouraging people in practices like dream work, and we'll be doing that when we're together at the live retreats. We'll be encouraging people in a particular forms of journaling, and in fact, people even having journaling partners that they stay connected with in between sessions. We'll be encouraging people in self-care through uh, body-mind connection. We're going to be using sound and movement because sometimes, and I'm certainly one of these people, I've tended to approach things from the head first and it's a little bit more awkward to get the body involved. You know, if somebody announces now we're going to do a Sufi dance and I've got to go to the ladies' room. So obviously one of my areas where I need to, to do some non-constricting is in the area of movement. And so we'll be gently encouraging people to break past some of the ways that they have been kind of buttoned down, tied down into any of the I'm the kind of person who thinking and encourage them to put new understandings to what they think they're capable of. Um, I think I just mentioned sound as well. And when people are at the on-site retreats, every afternoon, of they're here for parts of five days, three complete morning till bedtime days. And every afternoon included in the journey is their choice of a body-mind-spirit therapy at the ARE Health Center. So they could choose during that time to do uh, a sound therapy with tuning forks, or they could choose to have a massage or craniosacral work. And we know that many uh, body-based therapies will tend to awaken deeper awareness because these patterns get stored in the muscles, in the cells. And so we want to give people the opportunity to go into these things in a variety of ways. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think one of the things that makes this program so appealing is the fact that it is such an integrative approach. And I love that about your work, how you take so many different influences and you're able to integrate them together so that people can easily digest them, but more importantly, put them into practice in their everyday life. Um, there are a couple topics that I'd like to touch on a little bit more that you okay, have mentioned right. that... I think some of our listeners may want to know a little bit more about that are part of your integrative approach. One of them is vibrational energetics. I was yes. wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how that's related to maybe chakras or body memory and how mm -hmm. that plays into your integrative approach in this program. Well, we've chosen the term vibrational energetics to keep it as broad as possible because right. in some cases it may be a practice as simple and as profound as noticing that when we are in a particular emotional pattern, there is actually a vibrational or a pulsing sensation or a heat or a coldness. Those things tend to flow from conditions in the energy body. So in one sense, it will be noticing the way our emotions themselves tend to have an energetic component to it. But then there will be more of what we might think of as the traditional energy approaches, energy medicine, maybe some tapping on acupressure points, um, working, working with qigong or yoga. All of those things are really addressing the energy body. Working with, now Edgar Cayce didn't recommend necessarily targeting a particular chakra. He, he stands out from the crowd in that respect. 
but he does talk about addressing the chakra system in a unified balancing way and so working with balancing chakra energies may be and again all of these will depend on the individual it's not that everyone in the program will do every one of these things but they will all be part of for someone and particularly maybe someone who is uh, not as ready to get at some of the unconscious patterns a really deep massage might be the most profound experience in vibrational energetics that that person could opt for because Many of us have had that experience of as a particular muscle knot is being worked on, suddenly there's this flow of emotion because the body. And so if we think about the level of energy as the most subtle and usually the first, it, it, it's like what gets locked in the energy body may eventually manifest as a physical symptom and of course most energy practitioners will say that long before we have physical symptomology there's some blockage disruption distortion in the flow of the energy and it could be years later that there's a, a physical ailment that might manifest it's also true the other way around that certain ways that we have of armoring ourselves and how we hold our body can over time impact our energy flow. So it seems to be a two-way street where our thoughts, our emotions, particularly the strong and unpleasant ones, can tend to mess up the flow of our energy. But at the same time, getting that energy flow then to be restored can go a long, long way toward freeing us from some of those patterns. Like, and so, and I, yeah, go. no, I was just going to say that everything we're doing kind of puts figuring out our problems in the back seat and processing what's going on in the front seat. Excellent. And we're talking about in your integrative approach here, and I'm curious because this is something I think about a lot. I I, th I think the the beauty of the integrative approach is I think it's so essential for what we're going through on our evolutionary path right now. I think this one single approach and one answer to everybody's solution is not not really resonating with a lot of people. Which I think the, this integrative approach you have is really the solution to that issue. You brought together so many different ideas, and you know it's not this one path for everybody. You really cater it to the individual, and I guess in saying that, why do you think it's so important that we have this integrative approach now more than ever when it comes to evolutionary or evolutionary spirituality? Well, from the evolutionary side, we as a human race are always going to be the, the reflection of the whole spectrum from the least awake, conscious, and aware to the most awake, conscious, and aware. And one of the great seminal evolutionary spirituality thinkers, Ken Wilber, describes the situation in terms of center of gravity. Where is the center of gravity, given that in any civilization you're going to have the full spectrum from the least conscious to the most? If we look at the long picture over time, a strong argument could be made that the center of gravity is moving toward greater consciousness, greater awareness, greater openness. And I'm always struck how people will look at events in the world, for example, and say, oh, things aren't getting better, they're getting worse. Look at the terrorism, look at the, look at the prejudice, look at all of these things going on. There's no doubt that there are terrible things going on. But, you know, we uh, this summer have been watching the CNN series on the 70s. And I blissfully lived through the 70s. And as I look back on it now, I think, my gosh, what a hellish decade. So I think often when we think that we're not moving forward as a human race, we are not taking history enough into account. There will always be, because humanity will always be the full spectrum, there will always be the outliers in the negative sense of heinous acts of cruelty and, and everything else, but there will always be the outliers who are the ones who are awake. And I think for many of us, 
when we get on the spiritual path, often it begins as being about us. We're hurting. We want more. We want we want enlightenment because it sounds like it would be so fun and great and wonderful. But the spiritual path has a way of stretching us past it being about our own salvation, if I can use a religious term, you know, it's not just about my expanding consciousness, my attaining something. It's that as a member of a human race that is ultimately an expression of a single consciousness, where do I want to be on this spectrum? As I pull myself inching along, admittedly, it's a slow process, but as I pull myself along, I pull the whole along. And I think that is the, the, the real, as we move more and more into that, it becomes another layer of motivation because what we do is no longer just so that we can feel better, more spiritual, or whatever it may be. It's because we, we take on a certain responsibility and we join with others who share that responsibility and that's where the consciousness begins to leverage and being in a small group of people and by the way the journey is a very limited as you can imagine given the personalized nature we have a maximum number of spaces of 20 and if we don't get the right 20 people for an intentional group it might be smaller than that but the idea is these will be a group of people who will be working both on their own growth and healing and on our collective growth. Wonderful. And Lynn, you've written a book entitled Beyond Soul Growth, Awakening to the Call of Cosmic Evolution. And I love this book and this whole idea that you, you toss around about cosmic evolution. I think it's such an important concept for, to familiarize yourself because we are truly immersed in what's happening right now and we're very much experiencing it. But anyways, in saying that, um, how, as you look into the future thinking um, evolutionarily, I guess I'd say, what excites you as we look into the future on this, this spiritual journey that we're on? Well, Brent, I, I think I would say there are two things. One, coming at it from the world of people interested in spiritual growth, the idea that so many more people now are alive to the possibilities of a more unified consciousness, people involved in practices that will take them closer and closer to that. The second thing is that for me, the evolutionary theory has the best promise of unifying people from many disparate walks of life. The scientist may not believe in God, but doesn't really matter because that person is completely involved in evolutionary exploration. The, the person of uh, interested in biology and understanding how physically health and wellness is part of the evolutionary development of the human species, might not be thinking about meditation, and yet, nonetheless, any advances made in understanding and working with how we, as an evolving species, carry our evolutionary past and are moving forward to our evolutionary future, is nonetheless contributing to our collective growth. The evolutionary psychology that gives us a better understanding of why we are the crazy mixed up creatures we can be at times, making a huge contribution to people accepting what you and I were calling the shadow a little while ago, because the shadow has a lot to do with our evolutionary past and what was necessary to survive. So the, the promise to me about the evolutionary approach is that instead of this sharp divide between those who have a theistic and or religious or spiritual approach and those who are atheistic and not interested in all of that mumbo jumbo, the divide is, is melts. The more you become evolutionary in your approach, the more everyone is working on different facets of the same evolution. And I think tremendous things are going to come from that. Absolutely. Now, Lynn, we talked previously about the shadow self and how it's such an important part 
in the integrative approach to spirituality, um, getting to know your shadow self and working with those patterns that come up as you do that. Um, why is the shadow self so important to you in the work that you do? To me, the shadow self has become increasingly important to keep in the picture, both within my own experience and with the clients I see. A lot of people who are deeply spiritual have gotten the idea, and they didn't make it up, they're told this a lot of times, that if you do everything right, if you meditate, if you work with your dreams, if you look for signs and, and, and omens along the way, if you have the expansive, love everybody spiritual beliefs, things should work out great for you. But I see a lot of people that are doing all those things, and it's not working out so great. We have been uh, many times in particularly alternative spirituality movement that has understandably wanted to go away from old punitive religious systems and notions of original sin, part of what can happen is the idea that we can spiritualize away our wounds and our dark places. And this has been called by one writer, spiritual bypassing. And what will happen, that's one of the ways we manage to keep ourselves stuck. We keep thinking, if I just renew my efforts to meditate, if I just put a little bit more effort into my discipline from the Search for God group this week, if I just read another book, go to another conference to get inspired again. But there comes a point in our growth where addressing those, I, I think of, of some of the things that we will often want to deny as being like unhealed abscess, abscesses. Now I'm talking about the, the part of the shadow that people find unpleasant. And we know that if the skin heals over on a physical wound, but there is something unaddressed beneath the surface, it will get bigger and fester and eventually cause a problem. So sometimes the things that are the denied parts of ourselves take on much more of a weighing down and, and arresting quality than they would if we would say, okay, this is, this is here, what is the gift in it? And often people are amazed to find out that there is tremendous strength, energy, there are resources locked away in those shadow parts of the self that will become the fuel of further growth. So that's why, to me, I, I usually look for what is it that I'm not aware of when it seems like I'm doing everything right, but it's not working out. And I try to do the same with my clients. It goes back to that idea. If you keep doing it the same way, but you keep getting the same results, there's got to be more to the picture. And the journey to wholeness and integrative growth is designed to help people gently become more aware of those things. And in a, a very affirming and supportive way, help them grow beyond them. Wonderful. Wonderful. And thank you so much. And I just wanted to end on one last question kind of um – for our listeners out there, I'm sure some of our listeners and everyone out there is kind of struggling to work through these times and, and work with our shadow self and, and move on this evolutionary path. And it's not always easy. Sometimes we face a lot of difficulties along the way. Um, for somebody who is facing a bit of difficulty working with their patterns and recognizing this and maybe kind of waking up to the whole idea of this even, what a piece of advice would you give them to encourage them on their path? I think the biggest single piece of advice, assuming that they're going to be working on their own and they don't have a, a, any kind of a coach or mentor, is to develop the capacity to do what Edgar Casey called, step aside and watch self go by. And th that is, th develop the capacity for self-observation. Now, I don't mean necessarily to do that in a way that is self-critical, self-judging. I see people all the time who are almost frozen by constantly running a self-monitor in all of their interactions. And we're not talking about that. So much as the ability to keep a part of the mind tuned in. What's happening in my body right now? What's happening in my emotions right now? What am I assuming right now that maybe isn't so? 
but I've just assumed it for so long that it's driving my entire response. And then after the fact self-observation, to just sort of be the proverbial fly on the wall. Because every single time we try on watching ourselves from outside of ourselves, we're actually trying on the next larger, more expansive level of consciousness in order to be able to even be exterior to our own thoughts and feelings, we have to move to the next level. So I would say a gentle, non-self-condemning, more a curious, hmm, what's she up to now? Or, wonder what that's all about. Why am I doing that? Oh, isn't that an interesting feeling I'm getting right now in my throat or my chest? The more people can develop that capacity, the more they will discover that they are not bound by these unconscious patterns that come up. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Your message is, is very profound and very inspiring. So I thank you so much for not only being on the show, but for doing what you do and so having this, this journey to wholeness and integrative growth program. I think it's going to be a very powerful tool that will really help out a lot of individuals. So thank you. We're very excited about it. And thank you for giving me the chance to talk about it a little bit. Of course, my pleasure. Thank you for being on the show. On behalf of everyone here at the Association for Research and Enlightenment and moretalk.tv, I'm your host, Brenton Bickerstaff, reminding you that you are an essential part of conscious evolution. What you choose to think and act upon every day energetically affects the whole. Always strive to continually learn and improve the quality of life for yourself and, of course, for all those around you. Thank you so much for tuning in to Reflections, the wisdom of Edgar Casey, and I hope everyone has a wonderful week. Much love. And now it's time for the thought for the day here on Reflections, the wisdom of Edgar Casey. And joining us to read the thought for the day today and share in his own thoughts is Dr. Bill Austin. Bill, thank you so much for joining us today on Reflections. Hi, Brent. Great to see you again. Always a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Likewise, my pleasure. And if you can go ahead and read the thought for the day today and share your own personal thoughts on it. I'd be happy to. This thought comes from reading 830-3. Hence, as has been given, know yourself to wh in whom you believe. Not of earthly, not of material things, but mental and spiritual, and why? And by keeping a record of self, not as a diary, but your purposes, what you have thought, what you have desired, the good that you have done, we will find this will bring physical and mental reactions that will be in keeping with the purposes for, it, for which each soul enters a material manifestation. To me, this thought brings me back to, have I set my spiritual ideal? You know, what are my inner desires? Uh, and uh, who do I trust to help these desires become manifest? I can apply my effort, but I can't say that I have full confidence and trust in myself to manifest all of this. So I need to go to a higher source of information and uh, help with all of these things. And I think as I do that, it will help to guide my mental thoughts and my, and my physical manifestations will result from that. You know, when he talks about, you know, keep a record of self, not so much as a desire, a, a diary. You know, I went to the store today, got some more peanut butter, or whatever it is that I was doing today. But uh, how did I feel about going to the store? You know, what were my thoughts when I was in the store? What what were my reactions to the individual that was checking me out? You know, who threw my avocado in the bag, bottom of my shopping bag? You know, how did I react to it? To all of that. Um, and I think those are important, you know. Did I bless that person or curse the person, you know, when that came about, you know. Um, 
do I have to start bagging my own groceries? So what's my inner reactions to all that? And that may sound like silly stuff, but we go through that stuff all day long, you know? Right. And how are we feeling on the inside? You know, are we feeling peace and enjoyment, you know, or are we feeling hassled and frazzled? Uh, I think those are the things that we really need to reflect on. You know, when we lie down at bed at night and say, well, how'd you do today, Bill? You know, well, you know, sometimes the readings talk about this. You win a few, you, you lose a few. But if, but if you can reflect on them, then you can say, oh, gee, sorry about that one. Let me try harder the next time, you know, because I was really off base with that one. I, I think with some of these thoughts, you can really have some, some fun with them. Uh, sometimes I have, uh, I bring a mirror along with me. Uh, that mirror is uh, called my wife, Diana, you know, who <laughs> can say, oh, really blew that one, Bill, you know. Uh, and uh, maybe in the future you could handle that a little bit differently. And of course, at that moment in time, I really don't want to hear that, you know. But it, and in the <laughs> evening, sometimes you can reflect on how, how did you feel with different things as you went through the day? You know, as you had to do right. your day-to-day -day stuff, how did it make you feel? And I think that's a reflection of how close we are with living our spiritual desires, and how close we are with our relationship or uh, being in contact with our relationship with God, the divine forces, which is always there. We may not be mentally there, but it can be a reflection to get back with the program. Right. Wonderful. Yeah, you raised some great points there. Um, th I love this because y you talk so much about reflection, and that really resonated with me. Of course, our show is called Reflections, and it's uh, it really comes out of the Casey materials that if, if there's one huge thing that the Casey material does, as you read each reading and you start to apply what you gather from each reading, it it builds up this reflective life, which I think is one of the most powerful things you can carry with you on your spiritual path is having a reflective life. And what I love about this reading in particular is that Casey gives yet another incredible suggestion in this reading where he talks about keeping a bit of a journal and he says not as a diary. So he's stressing the importance in this reading saying that it's not of earthly, not of material things. You don't want to do a play by play, which is your, you know, your typical diary is, is loosely based on kind of a play by play of what you went through. Of course you dive into some of what Casey talks about here where he says it's all about the focusing on the mental and spiritual, meaning your reactions to the things, how things made you feel, looking back, um, how, did it, how do you feel about it, going into it, were you nervous, um, did it give you excitement. And this is an incredible tool that um, I've been doing over the years, but it gives me focus again. I love re going over the readings more because it reminds me that maybe I've strayed from writing down what I'm going through. You know, not so much what physically is happening, but what my, my mental patterns are. And the beauty, I think, of doing something like this is, you know, a month down the line, a year down the line, 10 years down the line, you can look back at this and you can see that, okay, it's, you'll realize that it's not so important that I was going to the grocery store doing that this day. It's the most important thing, which is why Casey gives us this suggestion to keep this sort of journal is that okay this was i was this made me angry in that moment this this caused this reaction and then you know a week later i had the same reaction it's happening you know these patterns what you do is you get to see this big picture of basically uh, an an analysis of yourself i mean that's what he says he says you're keeping a record of yourself which is the most power one of the most powerful practices that you can do because you may not be able to figure out why you react to something but if you look back and you see 20 journal entries over the past year where the same thing keeps happening, you can say, okay, here's what my mental state is. Here's what my emotional state is. Here's what I was going through. And you can, you can plot out the patterns and it can do incredible things to help you work with what you're going through on a mental and emotional level, which as Casey stressed, that's what's building our physical level. It's, it's one thing to have a diary that looks at all the physical stuff, but to have that in front of you that says, this is what I was thinking on this day. This is what I was reflecting on. This is how I felt. That's, I mean, imagine how powerful that can be as for an individual to change their life. You, know, you, you talk about a, a wonderful tool that you're using 
taking a look at your mental patterns. I like that expression, your mental patterns. Uh, what a way to get to know yourself. Yeah. Your mental patterns, I think, are a reflection of what your inner spiritual desires are. And those mental patterns are also going to manifest your physical life. Right. You know, and it's such a powerful tool, an active tool, if you just do that. You know, a, a wonderful challenge to people, uh, yeah. and I'm saying this really for myself, is, okay, Bill, write down on a day-to-day -day basis what your ma mental patterns were like through the day. You know, maybe a, a short section of his, you know, the guy dropped my avocado, you know. What was my reaction? What was my mental pattern? You know, and take a look at that over a 30 day period of time. And I think we'd get a tremendous reflection of what we're manifesting physically. That's, uh, thank you for that. You know, that's a wonderful tool. Yeah, of course. Well, Bill, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts today with us on the show. It's always a pleasure having you on. Oh, it's great to be here, Brett. Have a great day today. Thank you. Thank you too. You.